my desire for a father figure in my life was so intense that I started to tolerate certain things that no kid should tolerate, that no kid should experience. Hey, Yaku, tell me, tell me your story. How did you get to where you're at today? That's a long story. <laughs> that's that's a, short, the brief version. That's a long story. Born and raised in South Africa, uh, single mom. Dad, I have a father, uh, present but but not active in our lives at, at the time. Uh, was an athlete, born and raised in the arts and entertainment industry. And then after a series of events, um, became a professional athlete. And that led to an end of a career and an era. And then I moved to the United States to continue the call on my life uh, by God in, in entertainment, arts and entertainment, you know, which led our, our whole family here, really. My mom, my sister, my brother. I mean, that's the family, you know. Nashville, Tennessee, nine years in Nashville and uh, two years in, in Dallas, Texas. So blessed. Brother, sister, and mom still live in, in Nashville, Tennessee, all in the arts and entertainment field. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a very abbreviated, quick version <laughs> of, of how I traveled and how I got to the United States. There's a lot to fill in there. No, I know. And just speak briefly to your the career in rugby and mm. football. Mm, yes, yeah. Uh, Rugby is a rugby is a religion in South Africa, and it literally rivals Christianity, for that matter. You know, men men live, breathe, and eat rugby. So you grow up with that, and both my brother and I, that's what we did. You know, um, God gave us a gift, and that's what it is. It's a gift, uh, and and it is a great topic for what we're discussing here because it it is really rugby is about a, a son trying to make his dad proud. That really is what it's about because every dad played rugby. So every dad played to a certain level. And there's kind of a vicarious living that every dad has kind of through his son wanting him to go to a higher level as a rugby player than he did. And for my brother and I, you know, our dad wasn't present, you know, at the games or even at training. And he was, you know, really the, the things we knew and we learned, we learned from just doing it or from watching, you know, so... Playing rugby was an escape for me. It really became something I could throw myself into. As a Christian, you know, we were we were raised by a mom who's who's phenomenal and walks a solid walk with the Lord, and we knew the Lord our whole lives and dedicated our lives to the Lord at a young age. But still, that social pressure of sport and excelling in that, you know, and for me it was even greater because there was no dad present. For me, it was it was it became seeking approval from coaches, school principals, you know, being affirmed as what you would equate it to a, a state championship or you know, an all American status and that kind of a thing, you know, and those things happened. They did, you know. I'm six years older than my brother, which put me in a bizarre position because it really um, put me in a place where. And nobody told me this. Nobody, nobody actually came to me and said, Yaku, this is your role. But I took upon myself saying, okay, well, I've got to be the dad. Which is very dysfunctional. Very dysfunctional. And at the time, of course, I didn't know. And, and nobody, my mom definitely did not put that on. If anything, she tried to be mom and dad. But I did because my brother is so much younger than me. You know, when you're talking, I'm 18, he's 12. You know, you're kind of dad, you know, and my sister is younger even. So there's a lot of mentorship there, but I think my relationship with my brother without question was directly affected, um, maybe negatively, because we, we couldn't just be brothers. Does that make sense? I mean, we, we couldn't just be brothers, you know. So, and, and we never discussed it. We didn't, actually, we didn't know any different, you know. Of course, my friends had dads, and that's something, and it was a longing for us. So rugby became important. So I ended up playing professional rugby in South Africa. And um, it's a blessing, you know, and, and uh, you definitely feel good about it. Uh, later in life, looking back, I realized that I worshiped two gods. And I worshiped, I worshiped Christ, but I worshiped sport. I worshiped rugby. Uh, Bjorn, my brother, also became a professional player, not in South Africa. He played in Ireland. 
Um, so both of us walked a very similar path. My journey was a, a little longer, but, but very similar, you know. And that ended abruptly. And my rugby career ended in a way that, that I, I don't really discuss and very few people know. But I do believe it ended because probably the, there wasn't the kind of counsel that I needed on a day-to-day basis to say, hey, son, this is how you do this. Or I did that, and if you continue to do that, it's going to have this outcome. Um, so I kind of had to learn by trial. You know, we had, a, we had a granddad that was involved in our lives, and, and he was an iron fist guy. Spoke very little, and when he spoke, it was very philosophical. But he was not, you know, I would see him periodically. You know? So, um, and we could talk a little bit about my relationship with my dad, but that was sport, rugby. And then I transitioned, came to the United States, and, and just really by default, uh, an agent in South Africa called a guy here without me knowing, saying, hey, Yaku's still young. He really... St- still should still play and I got a phone call from a guy who said we want you to play American football and I was still very and I'm competitive today but I still had I still had that locker room passion I still wanted the camaraderie with the guys you know I still wanted to be on the field with a a band of brothers you know and uh, so as as God would have it it just kind of happened you know three months later and it is, these things don't happen, so it's God. You know, three months later, I was working out for an NFL team, having never seen an NFL game in my life. And and the Lord wrote the script, you know, and, and I started playing professional football and ended up in Canada in a starting position in, in Toronto in the CFL. And uh, praise God, in the midst of that season, which is probably the hardest time in my life because I was in a foreign country. It was in a new place. There was no family, no support. And truly there, I started realizing what it's like to not have men in your life that are spiritual men, men of God that are willing to pour into your life based on their life experience. There was none, none of it. You know, now I'm in a society that's very socialistic. I'm in a society where in our locker room, I, I might have been the only of two Christians. And, and it was everyone out for himself. And there was no mentorship whatsoever. None. And anybody that plays pro sport will tell you the organization, there's no mentorship. I mean, it's an institution. You're a number. So it got lonely quick. And that's probably a season, if I look back, that I can say, did you miss your dad growing up? Yeah, absolutely. But as a, but as a 32-year-old playing a professional sport in Canada, I probably missed it more than ever. It was, a, it was a tough time. And then in that season, God is so good. He introduced me to my wife. Got married and quit football you know, immediately because I knew this is, this is a dysfunctional lifestyle to start a marriage you know, and, and moved back to the U.S. And, and, and here we are today with, with many other things transpiring. But that is rugby and, and, and football. And being in the United States, I can tell you so much of the guys who play, so much of it is to get dad's approval. So much of it is. It is earn approval. And that's not God's economy. You can't earn God's love and favor. It's given. But it is every day. You show up every day and you earn your position. You're disposable. Every day you got to prove yourself. And you live for that attaboy. Attaboy is a bonus. You live for a smile. You live for just a thumbs up or just another play. So what it did for me is it, it made me tough mentally and physically, but it completely tortured it and disfigured what God wants me to be as a man, completely. You know, and it took me a, a long time in life and, and a lot of really spiritual, deep spiritual counseling and rootedness with other men saying, hey, this is not who you are. You know, you've lost yourself, really. You've lost what community looks like. Community is not earning love, earning favor. So it kind of, and, and I see it in our society, in sport, sport, because any athlete will tell you they know they're not capable. They know there's a higher power needed. They know no matter how, how hard they work, their bodies break down. They know they need something else. You know, 
and it's not steroids and it's not even a coach it's something else because no matter what i do no matter how hard, hard i work it could it could all break down so you really start living for those moments of a an elder older man or a senior player affirming you you know and it becomes it becomes a god and it and it disfigures you really f from what god intends for you to be you know and that happened with me as it relates specifically to performance based and how you saw god because of that being your life growing up is that was that the transition then that you took to god as i had to perform for him also as a father yeah, and you know, you touch on that, and that's true. The way we see our earthly father is how we see our heavenly father. Until we get to a point where we realize, listen, they're separate. You know, a dad here on, on earth has an absolute role. I mean, the most sacred constitution here is marriage, and a dad being a spiritual leader, and really a dad creating, you know, a dad's ceiling in life needs to be his son's floor. You know, that's what we aspire to. That generation to generation, we're supposed to go up. So a dad needs to pour so into his son's life spiritually that where his son starts life is above where the dad is going to end life. And that is completely, completely absent in, in our culture. So for me, I, I, I longed for, man. I looked for, passionately looked for any guy that was older. You know, and my granddad kind of filled that role, and 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 the rest of our the rest of the grandkids called him crazy, crazy old man because he was very philosophical. I would sit for hours for him to make absolute no sense to get to a point because I just needed the time. Yeah, I just needed the time. You know, I I truly believe God protected me from certain things. I really I really do because it affected me. But at a young age, I was 12 years old, and, and we kind of have to talk about my dad to really do this. My dad left the household when I was three. They divorced when I was six. So I didn't see him much even in the earlier years. But when they, when they divorced, my mom, the, the woman that she has said, I want you to have a relationship with your dad, and I want you to see him. So I would. I saw him frequently. I would see him, we would never know when. He would disappear for four months, and now I'd see him for two days. Now, again, brother and sister was too young. They were infants, you know, a year and 18 months old. So they didn't see him, but I did. What happened was, so I would get picked up on a Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock, and we'd go straight to the bar. And I, and I spent hundreds of hours in a bar. At times, I was hidden behind the bar counter because no kids allowed in the bar, and they would feed me jerky. And my dad was a musician, an amazing man, a phenomenal man. He was a civil and mechanical engineer. He was a pilot, an amazing guy, so charismatic. I mean, I loved him. I, I can honestly tell you that it was not a day in my life that I, that I, that I did not like him, but I, I hated who he was. But God had a hope in me, and I started praying for my dad when I was six. Change him, change him, change him. So 25 years later, 25 years of praying, literally, seeing things that no kid should see, and not just me, but my family, my brother, and my sister, all the moments that you can imagine. And, and I'm not talking negative about my dad because I'm, I'm going to get to a point where I'm going to say, you know, it is how we finish. There is redemption. You know, that's why any, any husband that watches this or any dad that watches this, it's never too late. And no matter how much time you have left, it's enough. It's enough to, to create restoration. It's enough to make amends. It's enough for when you go, your kids to go, I know what a dad looks like. If it was a day or an hour or a year, in my case, two years. Last two years of my dad's life, he passed away last November. He, he came to the Lord. I got a phone call one day and he said, I just want you to know, I have a problem. 25 years I prayed and he could never say that he had a problem drinking. And he said, I'm standing outside a Christian rehab center. I want to give my life to the Lord and I need you to know you're not going to be able to reach me for three months. And he comes out of there having started a worship band and starts building a relationship with my sister who they had no relationship and my brother and myself. And I traveled to South Africa and I end. And here's a guy so anxious he called me and said, 
I need to tell you about Jesus. And I said, Dad, I know. He's like, no, no, you need to listen. I need to tell you about Jesus. So to me, it created restoration, tremendous restoration. But prior to that, very dysfunctional. I was 12 years old in a house and there's a party and there's, there's no kids, just me, all adults. And I can't find my dad. And this woman says, oh, I'll show you where your dad is at. And takes me into a room, locks the door and starts taking her clothes off. So I climb out the window and starts running. In South Africa, if you're in the middle of nowhere, it's the middle of nowhere. And this car pulls up in this two-lane path. And I'm 12 years old. I'm in the middle of nowhere, pre-cell phone age. I couldn't even tell, I couldn't even tell people where I was if, if I wanted someone to come find me. And uh, the guy rolling down the window is my dad's brother, who's a total criminal. He puts me in the car, takes me back to the party. And that night I sat in a corner for about five and a half hours till the sun came up and said, if this is what alcohol does, I won't touch it. And I don't know, I can't explain to you. At that moment, I didn't understand generational curses. I didn't understand, you know, how, how that works. I just knew in that moment that God put in my heart that you need to stop this because it won't stop. You need to stop because it will consume you. See, every single member of my dad's family, all his brothers, his dad, my dad, they were all alcoholics. And every single one of them divorced. And God laid on my heart and said, you have to stop the chain of divorce as a 12-year-old. And, and you cannot drink. And it's not about alcohol. I'm not, I'm not condemning the liquid. I'm talking just about me personally. So as a 12-year-old, I made that decision. And it's nothing to be, it's not something I, I, I'm hanging my hat on. I'm just telling you how powerful it was in my life as a 12-year-old to go, this stops here. I mean, I just can't, this can't happen. Because this life, this, I can't have this. So you ask, how does it affect my marriage? It really started there. There was a major 90-degree turn for me to realize this doesn't happen. And from then, I started praying. My mom always said, pray for your, pray for your spouse. You know, so for me, by the time I got married to Philippa, I was in a place where I had great spiritual mentorship, good leadership, to know, okay, what I, what I think a dad is, that is not what a dad is. So as a 31-year-old, now being 36, I got even more passionate. But this time my passion turned into Father showing me what a dad looks like. Because I'm going to be a dad someday and I can't be that. You know? So I, I got a gift from God really early at 12 to say things need to change. For me, it, it would, it, you know, it, it is, it's night and day. Do I, do, I want, do I want the time back? No, there's no resentment. There's full closure completely. There was, there's full healing. And honestly tell you, I love my dad and he's dancing on streets of gold with the Lord right now. But I can't, I can't deny what took place and what happened. And I made a lot of mistakes. I made mistakes that should have taken my life. To me, even the mistakes and even, even the social pressure, because in rugby, there was tremendous pressure on me to drink, to sleep around, to, to et cetera, et cetera. You know? Let's just put that aside for a second, because those things were extremely present in my life how long it took me to completely understand who God was, that's the biggest, that would be the biggest thing. If you ask me the one thing that it took from you, I could have known what I know now when I was 19. And I could have walked with the Lord the way I walk with Him now for the last 11, 13, 14 years. Had I had a dad in my life who made God his father and who made God priority number one in his life and wanted to pass it down to me in my life. I don't feel robbed. I don't. But those are the facts. If you ask me what is the, the number one impact it had, it had that. And really, if that is the impact, it trickles down and it affects everything else. What a good thing to have. Work ethic. And you might say, but he was an alcoholic. It was a bizarre combination. Bizarre. It's functionally dysfunctional. It was, yeah, yeah. So, so work ethic, I would say, 
uh, and then and then joy the moments I had the moments when you were with him the, the guy truly knew how to see the upside of life you know he really did bad things would be would be uh, being absent abdicating responsibility yes not being your yes your no not your no you know um, and then ultimately just control I would say the number one thing if there's one thing that I learned from my dad that, that it, there was it's positive in my life but it's a negative thing would be that he was always wanting to be in control of his life and that's not what we're called to you know a dad needs to show his son that son i'm not superman i don't need to be you know i don't need to control everything i don't need to know all the answers i'm willing to be vulnerable in front of you i'm willing to come to you as a dad and tell you i make mistakes see i never saw that never you know when i say this and i speak to my sister and my, and my brother i'm not trying to create excuse or cover up but let's 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 go let's go a couple more years back when Jesus hung on the tree and he's looking at a centurion and he's looking at a soldier who just nailed him to a cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I do believe he did not know what he was doing. And you might say, well, he knew. He knew he was drinking and he knew he abandoned his family. But I truly do not think he understood that, listen, every man in my lineage have died from alcoholism. Maybe there's Maybe there's a threat here. Maybe there's a spiritual component. But what you're asking me right now is something that's really a pet peeve of mine, and that's you know my struggles in the church with fatherhood. Is nobody holds the men holds the men accountable? There's zero accountability in the church on men saying, "Hey, hold on one second. You're a dad. We can't live for you no more. You're a dad." There's a son or a daughter watching every move you make, whether you know or don't know. Th th that accountability needs to be restored. The, the pride and the honor of being selected by God to be a father is so far beyond being selected to be a CEO of a big corporation or president of the United States or a four-star general in the army. I mean, the king of kings, the ultimate dad says, I deem you worthy to be a dad, to be a role model. We need to restore that image of saying, hold on one second. This is major graduation and major advancement for God to think I'm worthy of being a dad. And you might say, well, anybody can be a dad. It's still approved by the king of kings. He still needs to approve that conception, that pregnancy, that child's life. He needs to sign off on it, which means he looked at you and go, I have given you the resource and the power and the wisdom, and I walk enough with you to lead a young one to me. That's where we go wrong. I, I really believe that. And I'm not a dad yet. And I work a lot with kids, but I'm, but I'm passionately looking forward to, to re and it comes down to time, time and a dad being willing to say I, I was wrong I'm flawed because really as young men and, and you probably you can relate to this as young men we learn more through the mistakes of other men than we learn in what they tell us to do even when they come and share their mistakes their failures there's a bond that forms because it's the trust I believe if a dad can go to his son and sit him down and his son's 13 and say, let, let me tell you, I, I failed in this thing here. And this is how God sees it. Can we, let's pray together. Pray for me, I pray for you. That His son is going to come to him every time he failed, whether dad knows about it or not. He'll just be forthcoming. Saying, Dad, I failed. It's not just the absent fathers. Okay, You can't be presently absent. A dad can live at home and be at home and be completely absent. So I'm not saying it's just divorce that does this. I'm talking about a father actually being 
actively present in his son or his daughter's life. But for the men particularly, um, God gives us the power of choice. He gives us salvation and we choose it. We have full authority to utilize all the powers of the Holy Spirit. The power that's in the blood of Jesus. And at some point, regardless of what our dads did or did not do, we still have the Heavenly Father. We still have the power to choose to get to know Him. And as these men who are hurting, who are in a place of, of I, I'm a victim. Woe is me, you know. Well, everybody's been an alcoholic in my family, so I, I, might, I might as well bear. Well, everybody abuses women or everybody divorced, you know. You can still stand there and say, but hold on. Who is this Heavenly Father? And the second you make that decision, that's your first decision, to truly get to know the Heavenly Father, you're going to see, well, He operates in a whole different protocol. The character of God is not flawed and it doesn't change. To then make the decision and say, I choose Him as my Father and He will restore me and walk forward. So it is a choice. You, gotta, you have to make that choice. God is the ultimate gentleman. He will not impose himself on you. Obviously, you came to find forgiveness for your father. Yes, yes. How did that come about? Huge. Huge. And it absolutely, without question, elevated me to another level with the Heavenly Father. There is no question that to a degree, there was a buffer. It's like a bungee cord kind of pulling you back, you know, wanting to hold you back, and you want to break loose. You know, as an athlete, we do it by force. A guy's in front of you, you run him over, you know, or you avoid him. This is not how it works in the kingdom. You, you've got to address those things head on. They will not go away. So for me, when I finally got to a point where, I get, you know, I understand, like you just said, I understand. Wow. Revelation set in and forgiveness. And I could take love from the Heavenly Father and pass it on from a son to a father. Pass it on. When that forgiveness came, it opened me up. It truly, absolutely, without question, opened me up to go to a higher level with the Lord and receive more from Him. You know, and when I was able to speak blessing over my dad, my earthly father, while he was still alive, when I was able to go back and ask for forgiveness for my thoughts leading up to how I could potentially have spoken death over my own dad while he was alive, realizing that we're here to speak life. When that release came of me saying, God, I'm sorry, forgive me for this kind of son I was, not victim, I could have done something different. I couldn't have changed him or made it, but I could have served you better. And then be able to forgive my dad Huge release. Huge. And, and the mending happened, you know. Because then what happened was I was giving it to my dad regardless of whether it was being reciprocated. You know, I was, I, was, I was forgiving him whether he was receiving it or giving me love back or not. I was set free from earning it or looking to get that attaboy or even thank you so much for forgiving what I've done. It was, it's irrelevant. God told me, bless him and release him because you understand. And once I did that, huge, immeasurable. The pursuit of being the perfect dad is wrong because you can't be. No. The pursuit of resembling who Christ is, that's the only thing we should, we should, we should pursue, you know. And that means there is only one Christ. So I can't be perfect. So let, let's get away from the... the the lie the enemy shares with dads as well that if you oh you gotta be perfect or you might as well not try. Or listen, you got a couple you got a couple red ledgers on your record. So you know you kind of lost it. You know, not true. Not true. Be flawed. Be a dad that is so in tune with himself and so close to his son that he can go tell his son. I'm flawed, man. Because honestly, we don't. We don't look for Superman. 
boys speak, my dad's bigger than your dad, eh? you know, but that's because they love. That's not because of, of a real physical attribute. Much, any kid, any son, any boy will tell you, I'd much rather have a dad that's present, that knows exactly where I am, what I'm doing, that cares, that is involved in my life, than a dad that played NFL football or has some huge accolade or, or, or whatever, you know. Because it's really not about that for us. It's, it's really about time. I think every dad, good or bad, right or wrong, gives instruction. Okay? To some degree. Even my dad, who wasn't in my life. I mean, even, even in a drunken stupor state, I get instruction. You know? I don't think dads ever really sits down with his son. You know, regardless of what's on the end of the fishing pole. And just says, tell me what you're thinking. Let me listen. What's, what's going on in your life? You know, and become the go-to guy. Not just the commander. And I really believe it's a problem because of how we see God in our society. Our church, without question, has painted a picture of God, the judge. So you go, so you go to God when you want to know right from wrong. And you pray. And that is right. But that's not, that's not the full extent of God's character. And then we look at our dad that way. Yeah, oh, yeah, he's the judge. He's going to tell me what to do. Tell me what I did wrong. Even if he's right. What that does in that son's mind is it's just, it's that, it's that, you know, it's that soft hammer. But continuous soft hammer irritates you enough that it drives you away. So I think the biggest mistake that's made is to just be the one giving counsel. Even if it's good. There's times, man, when you just need to be. We just need a hand. You know, we just need to, how about I don't talk and you tell me something. I played football, son, in 1980 in high school. Surely it's changed. What is it like today to play football? Yes, Dad, it's tough, man. Why? Because there's pressures in the locker room. Tell me about it. And then you can come back with, we had similar pressures. Now there's a bond. Watch the Father Effect movie for free on YouTube.